I actually have two passages of Scripture. I want you to mark Exodus 12. Now, that's where we're going to spend our time this morning. But I want you also to look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. started to read this this morning, this fifth chapter, but I changed my mind right before worship service. Decided I'd read Hebrews 13. But as we prepare to take the Lord's table, I, I think it's always, I, I hope and I pray that every time I preach, that the Lord Jesus Christ in His person and His work is set forth. I, I hope if, if one thing can be said of me as a, gospel minister that that's the central theme of everything that I do every time I stand up. But when we come to this special time where we take this table, I think it always is important that we remind ourselves of the significance again of what's involved in eating this bread and drinking this wine and how it is a constant reminder, it's one of the reminders, it's one of the two ordinances given to us by our God that directs our heart, mind, and understanding to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And Paul tells these Corinthian believers here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, and we've got to remember the Corinthian church was just loaded with problems. They were divided over who they followed. Some followed Paul, some followed Paulus. Some followed Cephas, and some claimed the really righteous ones, some claimed they followed the Lord. And Paul had asked the question, well, who is Paul? Who is Paulus? Who is Cephas? What are they? They're all the same thing. They're earthen vessels of clay, ministers ordained by God to preach and declare the gospel of God's free grace. And he said, Paul preach, Apollos watered, but what does it all depend on? God gave the increase. They were divided over the spiritual gifts. They were tolerating ungodliness within the church. Matter of fact, they were tolerating some ungodliness, which the Apostle Paul said in verse 1 of this chapter, it's reported among you that there is fornication in the church. It's not even named outside the church. This is a church of God. But he says to them in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. As you are unleavened. You see that? What are we? Unleavened means what? We're, we're without sin. Now that doesn't mean we've achieved sinless perfection. But as we are in Christ, what is the believer? We are unleavened. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Be ye holy, even as my Father which is in heaven is holy. And I'm telling you, if you're in Christ this morning, you're holy. If you're in Christ this morning, you're not just merely righteous, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 21, what have you been made? You have been made right now in this present world, in spite of your condition, you are made the righteousness of God in Him. And God sees you in Christ holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. That's your state. That's where we stand. We are unleavened. That's what he, these people, with all their flaws, he says to them, what, you're unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now, turn back over to Exodus chapter 12. From the very beginning, when Adam fell in the Garden of Eden as our representative man, representative of all men and women without exception, and he plunged all mankind, all of us, the sheep and the goats, the elect and the non-elect, the wheat and the tare, when he plunged all mankind in depravity and sin and condemnation. God Almighty, instead of turning a thumbs down on man and destroying man, began at that point revealing by type and by picture 
that salvation rests exclusively. You hear me? It rests exclusively on an innocent victim dying in the place, room, or stead of the guilty. I heard a man who at one time I had great respect for who claims to believe and preach the same gospel that I believe and claim and preach. And he made this statement in a message. I listened to it, heard it with my own words. He said, if you believe that when Christ died, that he was the innocent, dying in the place of the guilty, you are at this time Ignorant of the righteousness of God. Now think about that statement. If you think that when Christ died, it was the innocent dying in the place of the guilty. In essence, you know what he says of anybody that takes that position? You're a lost person. Because to be ignorant of the righteousness of God, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 through 3, what is it? It's to be lost. Ignorant of that righteousness. Several things wrong with that, and that's another message for another day, but I'll just give you one. If Christ was not innocent, we have no Savior. Because a sinner can't die for me. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. And so God began by type and picture and shadow. At the very beginning, He reveals how salvation, something innocent, has to take the place of something guilty and bear the guilt. In Genesis 3.21, the true and living God says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats. Who did it? The Lord made coats of skin. And thank God, what did he do? He didn't give it to them and say, Would you please put this on? Would you accept this gift of grace? It said the Lord Put the coats of skin. Didn't give them an option, Bart. God put it on them. Why? They were His. They're, the righteousness was His to give, His to bestow, His to be established through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam and Eve had sown together for themselves after their sinful rebellion, which people say, well, if I'd have been there, I wouldn't have done it. You'd have done exactly the same thing, if not worse. But after their sin and after their rebellion and after their departure from the true and living God, joining themselves and aligning themselves with Satan and, and, and all that is against God, when they realized that they were naked before God, they had sewed together for themselves fig leaves to cover their nakedness. What a paltry attempt to establish a righteousness. And I tell you, this man made covering these fig leaves of self-righteousness was symbolic of the natural man's desire and willingness to work out their own salvation, a salvation that is absolutely opposed to and runs contrary to the real will of God by way of command. But again, instead of condemning them, what did God do? God Almighty removed those fig leaves of self-righteousness that had been made by Adam and his wife Eve. And God made coats of skin. Now listen to me. I, you, a lot of you guys are hunters. I ain't ever hunted nothing. I have cleaned a few fish since I got, not many, but I've cleaned a few fish since I've got that boat. And I know what it is to take skin off of, to fillet a fish. I know what that is. But you men, in order for you to, for you to get a skin, what has to happen? Something's got to die. And if it didn't die, I tell you, it's in a painful situation if you take its hide off while it's living. So in order for God to make scoat coats of skin, what does that imply? Something had to die. God Almighty killed something. Do you believe that? It's, it's got to be, it's true. God made these coats of skin for these people and he made it by the death of an innocent animal. I always, always wondered 
You know, what I don't always wonder, it's, it's quite clear to me why, why God chose a lamb. <laughs> One of the most innocent little victims you could ever possibly imagine. You know, they, they can't find water for themselves. They can't find food for themselves. They've got to have a shepherd. Somebody's got to lead them. They are at the mercy of every other animal. Have no defense system. Don't even have horns. Cannot defend themselves. And we have to understand, folks, that, that even with this first sacrifice of this innocent victim to provide this covenant or this atonement for their sin, these things could not, nor would they ever, actually intended to put away sin. Because if that had been the case, instead of God promising the seed to send the seed of the woman to put away sin, what would he have told them to do? Y'all do like I do. Y'all kill a victim, shed its blood, take its skin, and you'll be guilt free. Now we know that God did give, institute the, the, the tabernacle and all the rituals and routines that went around with that. But we know also all of that just like this. What is it? It's a picture and type of something else, something greater. There was something to come. We read it every time. We'll read it again this morning in Hebrews chapter 10. It is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to put away sin. It can't be done. Now, whatever light Adam and Eve had, and they did have some light, whatever that light was that God had given these two people concerning substitution and concerning satisfaction through the sacrifice of an animal on their behalf, I can guarantee you, you know what they began to do with their two boys after them? They began to teach those two boys without the shedding of blood what can there be. Sin cannot be put away. And all those who are of faith, in Old Testament time, New Testament time, all of them were looking for and desiring the coming of that first promise. They were looking for that seed. Of the How do we know that? I always think about it. I, I said it last Sunday, but we always talk about it at Christmas, but it's a good story to think about all the time. Oh, Simeon. He had been told by God, you will not die till you see God's Christ. And he picked that baby up in his arm and he said, Let thy servant go in peace, for my eyes have seen God's salvation. What was he looking for? The promise. And thank God what he had. Here it is. It ain't happened yet. I got the promise right here in my arm. This baby. And by God-given faith, you know what Simeon saw? He saw that person in his arm. He saw him growing up. You, I believe this with all my heart. He saw him growing up, David. He saw him obeying the law in every jot and every tittle. He saw him bearing in his body his sins according to the promises in Isaiah. He saw him dying in his stead. He saw him raised and ascended. He saw him sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's how he could say, I have seen God's salvation. What? Jehovah. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. They told him, this is Jesus. We hear Jesus, we think about sweet little loving Jesus. They heard Jesus, they thought in Greek and Hebrew. Jesus, what it? Jehovah our salvation. That's what he saw. Now, from this Old Testament verses we're going to look at this morning... I want us to look at the believer's Passover. And I want to show you several things this morning in this 12th chapter. Now, we, we don't have time to read all of it. But let's just pick up at verse 5 as he begins to talk about this lamb. Look at what he says in the first part of this verse. Exodus chapter 12, verse 5. Your lamb. You see this? Your lamb shall be... Without blemish. And amazing how he makes it so personal. Your lamb. <laughs> He's my lamb. I, I, tell, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do anything by way of salvation for my, my wife or my children or my granddaughter. For your friends or for your family. All I know is that he's my lamb. 
He's my righteousness. And I can tell you about him. I can point you to him. But only he can reveal himself to you as your lamb. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's got to be my righteousness. First thing I see here is this. That lamb that is to be offered in this Passover had to be a lamb that was out without blemish. And I, I looked again this morning just to make certain. Yeah, that the Hebrew word translated into the English, shall with that be without blemish, it means this. It means to complete, be complete. It means to be whole. It means to be entire. Or it means an even better translation. This is what it, it means to be perfect. It says your lamb shall be what? Perfect. Remember the law first mentioned? This word is used 91 times in the Old Testament. It's translated, shall be without blemish here. Fifteen of those times is translated in the English word, perfect. The very first time this Greek word, this Hebrew word is used, you know where it's used at? It's used in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. The very first time this word is used. Noah had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 8. Verse 9 says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. And perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Well, let's think about this perfect man for just a second. <laughs> He preaches righteousness for 120 years. Gets on a boat, shutting a boat for 360 days. The boat finally makes landfall, and he and his family come out of the boat after surviving the wrath of God that destroyed billions of individuals. What's the first thing this man who was perfect in his generation? What did he do? He had to be growing them grapes and having some wine ferment on that boat. First thing he does after he comes off the boat, after he builds an altar and glorifies his God for saving him and his family, he gets drunk. So he's perfect in his generation. He's without blemish. He's spotless. He's perfect. He's complete. It ain't based on him. Where is he perfect in? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I always find it interesting. Every generation, their mind was only wicked, evil, continually. That's what God's... Noah was included in that group. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, that's so important for you and I to understand. Because it signifies to us, this thing of perfection, it signifies to you and me the absolute sinlessness and perfection required from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Passover. Paul says this, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Here's the difference between him and me yet without sin. He made him, Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In order for the Lord Jesus Christ to be our righteousness, folks, he had to live a perfect life of strict obedience to God's holy law and justice is our substitute, our surety, and our representative. Our Lord Jesus Christ was so clear, was he not? He said, don't think I came to destroy the law. I didn't come to destroy it. What did I come to do? I come to fulfill it. For not one jot or tittle shall pass from the law till what? All are fulfilled. Were they fulfilled? Yes, indeed. Last words, it is finished. What? All the law, all the justice of a holy God 
against all those of the Lord Jesus Christ stood as their surety and substitute and representative, it was fulfilled perfectly and completely down to the nth degree. In order for the Lord Jesus Christ to make reconciliation for our sins, though, he had to have no sin in and of himself. Oh, I tell you what, the longer this thing goes about Christ being made sin in some mystical, magical, mysterious way, it just angers and outright, outright angers me to the very depths of my soul, the implications of such thoughts. I tell you, folks, in Leviticus 22, verse 21, Moses wrote, It, the sacrifice, must be perfect. It's the same word used in our text. Translated, shall be without blemish, to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Look at the second part of our text. Look at verse 5 again. It's got to be secondly. What's it got to be? It's got to be without blemish. It's got to be a male of the first year. What does that mean? Male of the first year. It has to be a male that's in the prime of its life. Not an old broke down lamb. Not one five, six, or seven years old, but the one that's in its prime. Well, what does this teach you and me? We're talking about all of it as a picture and type of the Lord Jesus Christ. This teaches us that our Lord Jesus Christ was to be offered up and put to death when? Not as an old man, but in full strength of years. How old was our Lord Jesus Christ when he died? 33 years of age. It's 26 years ago for me. <laughs> it's amazing what 26 years does to your body. And to your mind. <laughs> I find myself so forgetful. So easily agitated. So angry. Not our Lord. You think about it, our Lord Jesus Christ offered up his life, literally giving up the ghost. No man took our Lord's life from him, did they? He said in John chapter 10, I lay down my life. No man takes it from me. I lay down my life, and if I lay it down, what will I do? I'll take it up again. They went out to break our Lord's legs. What did they find? He'd already gave up the ghost. He died, listen, he majestically bowed his head when he had done everything that was required. And he gave up the ghost. I always think about old Pontius Pilate when he stood there in John 19 and he had questioned our Lord and he told our Lord, don't you know I got the authority to give you life or give you death? What did our Lord say? You have no power except it were given to you of my Father which is in heaven. Look at verse 5 again. <clears throat> he says, here's the next thing, you shall take it out from the sheep and out from the goats. This lamb was to be taken out of the sheep or out of the goats. That in other words, it was to come out of the whole congregation of Israel. In Israel, in turn, what were they to do to that to this lamb? All the house of Israel was to kill it. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Lamb, where'd He come from? He was taken from among men. Write down this verse. I don't have time to read it all to you this morning. Look at, write down Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 through 19. Go read it for yourself. Moses said, God's going to raise a prophet like to me. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to hear him. He's going to speak. You're going to bow. Now you will. And our Lord Jesus Christ, folks, he was the fulfillment of the first promise made to Adam and Eve in the garden. He was the seed of the woman. And he was also like us, folks, he was a near kinsman. Both able and willing, because you, you know anything of the story of the kinsman and the redeemer, they didn't have to redeem. They had to be willing to redeem. And thank God our Lord Jesus Christ, our near kinsman, he was both willing and thank God he was also able to do what? To buy us back off the marketplace of sin. It's called the seed of Abraham. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, Paul wrote. He saith not into seeds as a many, but as of one, and to thy seed. Abraham's seed, which is who? Us? No, it's us in Christ, which is Christ. 
But there's one more thing that I want to say to you this morning before we move on on this particular point. It says, And they shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. One of the dear ladies in the church corrected me on this many years ago, and I'm grateful for it. You know, we say some things sometimes that are erroneous. I used to say that they were to shut it up for 14 days. They had to make sure that in those 14 days it was perfect. That's not what this verse says. He says they're to shut it up until when? The 14th day. What's so significant about that? I did, get your hand on John Gill's commentary. I, I wish I had time to go through all of this, but this, this is some wonderful information, and it would do your soul some good. The, the 14th day, this 14th day they would shut it up until, it's what's called the 14th day of Nisan, which is the Hebrew calendar. The 14th day of the month. And this 14th day, he said, you to shut it up to the 14th day of the same month. You know what that tells us? It tells us the exact day of the Passover every year because it's never changed. Even today, when they celebrate the Passover, you know when they celebrate it? On not the 14th day, but the 15th day of Nisan. It's always the same. You say, well, why is that so significant? Well, think about it. The Jews were required to keep it up, keep that lamb, that, that lamb, the Passover lamb. They were to keep it, keep it up. That word keep it up means to guard it, protect it, watch over it. They were to watch over that sacrifice until when? Until the Passover. <clears throat> now the 15th day, and this is what's so significant about this. The 15th day, seeing it was in the evening, because notice the way it's language, and the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it, not in the day, but in the evening. When do days change in the Jewish calendar? Six o'clock in the afternoon. So instead of talking about on the 14th day, when was this thing to be offered up? On the, in the evening which would mean it's offered up on what? On the 15th day of the month. And he says on that evening, what does it require? The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Now remember, Israel's a type or picture of the true spiritual Israel. And as such, the sins of God's true Israel demanded that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ is our sin bearer. Isaiah said it best, he said, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All Israel killed him. And listen to me, all the sins of all the elect of all spiritual Israel demanded what? The death of this person. Required that he die. Look at verse 7. And, it, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the door of the houses wherein they shall all eat it. God required that the blood of that lamb, where do they sprinkle it? They sprinkle it on the, on the lintel, on the top of the door, and on the sides of the door. And I've heard some people trying to say it figures out to be a cross. We're just talking about a door. We're talking about an entrance. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the door, right? <clears throat> All of those who had that blood sprinkled on the door, on the lintel, and on the side post, everybody was inside that house, what happened? They were all spared. Everybody that didn't have the blood on the door, on the lintel, on the top piece, and on the side pieces, everybody inside that, what happened? Everybody that didn't obey the command, they all perished. And see, in the same way, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed to be ours by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of God's gospel and is to be rested upon and relied upon by true God-given faith. And apart from true God-given faith, folk, there's no salvation, there's no deliverance, none whatsoever. I said it this morning in the Sunday Bible class hour. I will tell you again, listen to this, in John chapter 3, verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. 
doesn't say he that believes gets life. It says he that believes, what have they got? They've already got it. He that does not believe, believeth not the Son. Listen, they will never see life. No possibility. There will be no unbelievers in heaven. But the ones who believe, how do we believe? By the grace of God. So here's mercy, we're not consumed. See, this is the thing. God didn't put the door. You know, he, he clothed Adam and Eve. But God didn't come down and put the door on the lintel and the doorpost for his people. He told them through his servant Moses, you tell Israel, you put the blood on the door and the lintel, on the doorpost and the lintel, and I'll pass over. Who put the blood there? The people did. Why? They believed the promise and the threat. They believed that if I put this blood on this door, what's going to happen? God's passing over me. And if I don't put it, what's going to happen? God Almighty is going to curse me and my family and destroy me. Isn't that the same thing that Paul said to those Hebrew believers? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that what he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I always think about Song of Solomon. Lord, draw me. Song of Solomon 1 verse 6. Draw me and we will run after thee. If he don't draw, what are we never going to do? We're not going to run after him. Now since it was placed on the lintel and the doorpost, the exit and the entrance of that, that dwelling place, it teaches us as believers all our going in and all our coming out through that door, the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb is always before our eyes. Look at verse 8 of our text. He says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Lamb has it roasted with fire. What's so important about that? Well, if you remember anything from our study in Leviticus, when we talk about fire in the Scripture, what is fire symbolic of? Judgment. Punishment. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. Was He not? And in that time that He was crucified, He endured the wrath of God for the sins of every single solitary sinner whom He represented. And these Israelites, he says that they were to eat the flesh of the lamb. You know, the Jews said, how can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? Only one way. Right? Believe on it. Rest in it. And see, this signifies that we must, by true God-given faith, what do we feed on? We feed on Christ. On His blood. On His righteousness. We rest on Him as the Lord our righteousness. Also, these Israelites were to eat the lamb. How were they to eat it? Same way we're going to take this in a moment. With unleavened bread. Leaven in the scriptures, what is it symbolic of? Sin. Evil. And this signifies that everybody who comes to Christ, the true, true Passover, how do we come? In true God-given sincerity and truth. Hate and evil and hypocrisy. And we come in true with a true godly sorrow over sin as well as true repentance in our hearts given to us by God Almighty. Look at verse 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden, yet all with water, but roast with fire his head and his legs, and the, with the pertinence thereof. Nothing, verse 10 too, and let, you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn it with fire. He tells us, told them and tells you me, the lamb wasn't to be eaten raw. It wasn't to be eaten sodden with water. That is to say, it wasn't to be boiled in water or wine or oil. And I believe this teaches us that, that Christ, what did he endure? He endured the full wrath of God and his judgment for all our justification. And nothing, nothing's to be mixed with it are added to it, are joined to him in his accomplished work of redemption. And this idea that the lamb was to be roasted whole, what does that mean? Not a bone was to be broken. You roast something whole, what do you do? You put it on a fire. Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the prophecy, what was it? It said, no bone of his body shall be broken. And they went out that day to break his legs, to speed up the process for his death. And what did they find? 
they found he had already gone, fulfilling the prophecy. Look at verse 11. Or verse, verse 10, he says, it says that nothing of the Lamb was to remain. What does that teach us? We take him all. We take his person as divine. We take his person as human. And we feast on it all. all of it. Now verse 11. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. What does this mean? Well, they were to eat the Passover dressed and ready to leave Egypt. And that's the Lord's Passover that saved them. Now that's it. Here's the thing we get from this. This world, just like Egypt was to national Israel, it's no longer our home. We're, we're pilgrims. Temporarily here, but what are we waiting on? We're waiting on our Lord's call to go home to, to Canaan. Paul said of those Hebrew believers, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in this earth. That's one of the reasons I read Hebrews 13. He says, let us go therefore into him without the camp bearing his reproach for here, what have we got? We've got no place of rest. We do have some comforts here, but there's no true rest for the child of God. Look at verse 12 and 13. We'll quit. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the hands of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses of where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I tell you, can't you find great comfort in that one phrase, when I see the blood? What will I do? I'll pass over. That's why this, the ordinance was called a Passover, because think about it. Who's coming down that night? God didn't entrust this into the hand of an angel because who, who belongs to whom? That's about, to whom belongs the issues of life and death? Huh? It's the Lord. The Lord didn't entrust it in the hands of an angel. He himself came down that night and passed through this land. And that's why it's called a Passover because the Lord at the sight of that blood of that lamb, what did he do? Now, this isn't pretend. He's not acting like nobody died. Because here's the reality of it. Everybody who stood inside of one of those homes where that blood was on the doorpost and on the lentils, it was as if they had died. All Israel did die that night. But where did they die? In the person of that Passover lamb. God didn't pass over them because of their faith. He passed over them because of the object of their faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, God could pass over them because His justice would be satisfied in the one that death of that Passover lamb tempified, the Lord Jesus Christ. You think about it this way, and we'll close. Look, look at one, one more passage of Scripture. Look at Romans chapter 8. In the person of that lamb... Every firstborn of national Israel died. And that teaches you and me that God's judgment and His wrath has to pass over us because somebody has already died in our place. Look at Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are where in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the wrath that I rightfully deserve, where did it fall? It fell on him. And our Lord Jesus Christ bore the wrath that I rightfully deserve so fully and completely away. Oh, there's nothing left for me to bear. That's why he can say, Come to me all ye that labor and heavy laden, and what will I do? I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy. 
I, the yoke religion puts on people so tough, his yoke's easy. And his burden is light. Why? He's carried the load. He satisfied, Lord. He did what I could never do. And he did it willfully and thoughtfully and with great love because he loved us before the foundation of the world. Okay, let me 